Hi guys, I'm Kamlesh from Plugin India. I recently uh, gave a, a presentation to a charge point operator in Gurgaon and I thought you know I could uh, share this with the EV community and you guys as well. Uh, this essentially is a presentation where I talk about uh, what's happening in the Indian EV scene and most of you who follow Plugin India must know all of this. This will be more like a beginner's guide for those who don't understand uh, what's happening in the Indian EV scene. Uh, it, might, it might be eye-opening for them. But this is the first slide. It says India's EV story from the eyes of the EV community. If I go to the next slide, I'll just talk quickly about Plugin India for those who don't know. Uh, we are an independent team working part-time on this platform. Our platform is uh, our uh, a website, a YouTube channel, and we also have a podcast. We uh, we also have a large community of EV owners and EV lovers in our WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups, Discord. So find us in these groups, and if you're an EV owner or EV lover, definitely join. We visit a lot of uh, startups in the EV space, and we showcase the cool work that they do. We created this Recharge India mobile app, uh, which right now is defunct. Uh, but yeah, for a good uh, five to six years, it was a go-to app for uh, EV owners to actually uh, find charge points. So many businesses opened up their locations and set up these charge points uh, in 2015. Ultimately, we don't have the bandwidth to update this app and to uh, add more, more features. We decided to move over to Pulse Energy. And uh, yeah, you can find those uh, points there. Sometimes we visit uh, corporates and do some EV training. So we've done that for some uh, companies in the industry. That's the basic slide on about Plugin India. I will quickly talk about government policies. There are a couple of policies which are very important for, for the Indian EV uh, ecosystem. Uh, one is the central government policy called FAME, Faster ad Adoption and Manufacturing of Electric Vehicles. And the second policy which is National Mission of Transmotive Mobility and Battery Storage. Both of these policies are very progressive policies according to my view. They offer demand and supply side incentives. And ultimately the goal of these policies is to uh, develop the ecosystem of EVs. Right, so let's go to fame. Let's talk about fame. Uh, apart from offering subsidies to various EV models, the goal of the policy is to catalyze the EV market by enabling the development of a supportive ecosystem for EVs. At the central level, multiple ministries and departments have been involved in formulating this policy. Um, I personally feel this policy is very well rounded with some rough edges. Um, the policy offers generous subsidies to, to stimulate demand in certain electric vehicle segments. For example, subsidies offered for two-wheeler and three-wheeler EVs and subsidies are also offered for commercial vehicles like delivery vehicles, buses, taxis, cabs. So in these segments, the two-wheeler, three-wheeler and the delivery and the commercial vehicle segment, uh, EVs are taking off rapidly. Uh, we have seen year-on-year -year growth in terms of EV sales in these segments. The personal car segment has no subsidies. That's the idea from the government. I kind of agree with them. At the same time, I feel if certain companies are making uh, small cars that are meant for the common man, and I think that some incentive would be nice to have, you know. Apart from subsidies to, to uh, stimulate and to create demand, I feel the most important aspect of this policy is that it encourages localization and making in India. Ultimately, uh, as an EV OEM, uh, you can't just keep importing components or even vehicles from China or any other country, uh, you need to start making here, right? So that's how you can scale up. As an EV OEM, you're eligible for subsidies only if 60-70% of the vehicle is locally manufactured components. Because this subsidy is tied to making in India, this has encouraged a lot of localization by EV startups. Motors, controllers, power electronics and a lot of other components are being made in India. Um, this kind of ecosystem were not available just five years ago. In fact, if you look at it, many electric scooter startups like Aether Energy, Ola, Ola Electric are making every component in-house or, or procuring it from Indian vendors uh, and only import lithium cells. So this kind of localization focus is one of the big successes of this policy. This is unseen in other industries like mobile phones, consumer electronics, where India still depends on China for many components. So yeah, that's about fame too. Next is uh, the National Mission on Transformative Mobility and Battery Storage. This is a very interesting policy that uh, the goal of this policy is to you know ensure cell manufacturing ecosystem is built in India. So this policy is offering incentives to to companies that are investing in manufacturing these lithium cells. This policy has been pretty successful. It has already drawn investments in cell manufacturing. Ola Electric, Reliance, New Energy, Hyundai Global Motors, Rajesh Exports have been shortlisted under the subsidy scheme to manufacture cells in India. And at the same time, we have some state governments who have also formulated policies 
and uh, they have their own incentives uh, they many states waive off uh, rto many registration road tax some states also offer uh, additional subsidy to stimulate demand for example uh, gujarat and maharashtra offered uh, subsidy for two wheelers and for three wheelers now the targets for the fame and fame 2 uh, subsidies are pretty ambitious what the fame 2 document says is that if india could realize EV sales penetration of 30% of private cars, 70% of commercial vehicles, 40% of buses and 80% of two-wheelers and three-wheelers by 2030. If this is realized, then the lifetime cumulative oil, oil net energy and net carbon savings could be larger than the savings from the incentives offered. Will India achieve these targets? I don't think we will achieve these targets. There's a lot of potential in the commercial vehicle and three-wheeler segments, but the private cars and the two-wheeler segments still have uh, strong lobbies and uh, companies who don't want change so I don't think that's going to happen anyway but at least there's some goals and if we can at least come halfway I think that's a success for me uh, next I'm talking about improvements and criticisms of the policy in order for the fame 2 policy to be to show its full potential what's important is active participation is needed from the automotive sector unfortunately this policy does not incentivize active participation from vehicle manufacturers so many two-wheeler and car OEMs don't offer even a single EV in the portfolio and this is 2022 now, if you compare this to the Chinese policy it's very interesting they have a mandate where a certain percentage of all vehicles sold by manufacturer each year must be battery powered and to avoid financial penalties every year manufacturers must earn a stipulated number of points which are awarded for each EV produced uh, this requirement gets tougher over time with the goal of having EVs make up 40 percent of car sales by 2030 the car companies in China are are compliant they they understand that you know the government wants uh, people to use EVs uh, because it's good for their country and it's good for their environment so the car companies are obliging in india there's no such mandate for these oems you know the car and the scooter and the motorcycle oems so for these manufacturers it's business as usual so so yeah it's a, it's a criticism from the community where you know the policy could have incentivized manufacturers or penalized certain manufacturers if they don't launch evs second criticism of the fame 2 policy is that the taxation for certain components are, are high and many component makers, um, battery makers, they complain to us and they say that uh, certain components could fall in, in a lower tax lab. Overall, in my opinion, the government has done a fantastic uh, job. Now the onus is on the industry you know, to ensure that India stops importing so much oil every year. Okay, let's move to the next slide, EV adoption in India. I have a couple of points on two-wheelers and cars. So we release these monthly articles on our website or blogs kind of a thing where we t we track uh, the sales of two wheelers and sales of cars and we also have make some pretty interesting graphs so for october if you see uh, compared to 2021 and 2022 there's a 286 percent increase in the number of uh, two wheelers registered in india here you can see the penetration graph so looking at this percentage i feel that uh, we ev two wheeler sales will be well past the 10 percent mark in the next eight to ten months these are the major players okinawa and hero are leading this year uh, ola electric is doing really well for a one year old company uh, what they're doing is pretty incredible in my opinion um, then you have ampere and then you have aether who's also doing very very well and then you have the big guys guys tvs and bajaj uh, doing okay hero okinawa and hero will fall, fall aside their subsidy has been withdrawn i think the startups will take over ola aether and even big eyes will start getting serious soon uh, with their numbers should increase next year so you'll see a completely different chart next year pretty interesting this if you see the growth here the two-wheeler sales uh, ev two-wheeler sales is increasing steadily there's uh, no major drop as such this article in the graphs showed you uh, certain trends in the two-wheeler space now if you go to the car space there's a 291 percent year-on-year increase uh, the market share of 1.38 percent is very small so if you see uh, the the calendar year tata motors is the only only company that is registered more than 30,000 evs uh, the next uh, successful car oem is mg motors and then you have uh, hyundai byd and mahindra here so yeah there's nothing much to look at because tata motors is the only serious player here but if you look at the interesting part for tata motors 9.5 percent of their passenger car sales are fully electric and for mg motors 18 percent of the car, car sales is fully electric so what does this tell me this tells me that if a car oem launches an electric car at a decent price point people will buy it it's, it's been two years since Tata motors launched their nexon ev and it's already 10 percent i feel this is extremely promising i would recommend you go to our website go to the vehicles menu go to sales sales reports here i would encourage you guys you know to check it out we publish this every month and i would thank uh, 
uh, Karthik Ayan from Xeon who helps me in, in the analysis. Let's talk about the bottlenecks, right? So many people say that charging infrastructure, range of vehicles is a huge bottleneck for EVs, right? So that's the mainstream view of why EVs are not doing well. But in my opinion, in the community's opinion also, OEM apathy towards EVs, that is the biggest bottleneck. Big name vehicle manufacturers in the two-wheeler and car space have stay away from making EVs. Many of these vehicle OEMs have, have a vested interest to keep selling ICE vehicles which offer better profit margins and thus they are not launching EVs. So I'll give you two examples, right? Tata Motors is one of the major supporters of EVs but I'm still giving you an example. If I walk to a Tata Motors dealership, a consumer has a choice of two electric cars and or 10 or more ICE cars. All the, all the marketing you see at these dealerships, the posters on, at, on the walls, um, the, the knowledge of the sales staff is all geared to sell ICE cars. The game is totally skewed towards ICE cars in Tata Motor dealerships. Similarly, if I go to a Maruti dealership, <laughs> I won't find even a single EV. Another example if I'll give you in the two-wheeler space, if I go to a Bajaj motorcycle showroom, uh, they are one of the largest motorcycle manufacturers in India and yet they don't offer even a single EV in their portfolio. They are a rich company, they have a lot of money, but yet they want to protect their motorcycle, ICE motorcycle business. There's no choice for the consumer. That is a big bottleneck according to me. This lack of interest by vehicle makers to launch EVs, it's a big issue. And I don't think this is going to be so, get solved soon because uh, these many of these OEMs won't launch EVs until 2025 and later. So even, maybe 2026 they may get serious and launch one model. That won't help, right? That won't help at all. So next bottleneck is, is the cost. Electric two-wheelers and three-wheelers are co cost competitive with subsidies. Electric cars from Tata Motors have a 20 to 30% premium uh, over ICE models. This percentage has come down with the launch of the Tiago EV uh, hatchback. The two-wheeler and three-wheeler space, the cost is pretty competitive, especially with subsidies. The interesting thing is once the subsidies are withdrawn after 2024, then it remains to be seen how the two-wheeler and three-wheeler companies adapt. And I think I feel they have to start preparing right now, you know, to, for that eventuality. And next is the charging. I live in an apartment and I charge my EV in an apartment. It's very straightforward. But at the same time, let's let's assume the use case of 500 flats in a society complex, right? As of now, 2022, there are maybe 10 or 15 EV owners. So it's easy to set up charge points and uh, charge your EV. But what if tomorrow, if 200 people get EVs, right? Electric cars or scooters, then the apartment complex will need to think about upgrading the transformer because the load is not enough. This can be a bottleneck in the coming years. We will need policies for this too. I mean, will an apartment invest money in uh, upgrading a transformer? or will the municipality or the state government be involved in that process. I feel it can be a bottleneck in the coming years, but right now it's not an issue. Most people are able to charge in apartments, but yeah, this can be a bottleneck in the future. Highway charging, currently, if I go to plug share, if I go to the website and I can see, uh, we have many highways electrified by charge point operators. If you look at uh, our videos, we have done a trip from Mumbai to Shimla using a Tigor EV. Many people in the community do these trips regularly. So fast chargers are available right now in India, but as the number of EVs increase, you will start seeing lines at these fast charging stations. So you need to have more number of fast chargers in multiple locations on multiple highways. So massive investments are needed. And we know many charge point operators are working on adding more number of uh, fast chargers as the demand increases. This can be a bottleneck. We need a, a cooperative response with the government and the private players to set up these fast chargers. Okay, let's go to the next slide, trends and opportunities. There's a huge opportunity for charge point operators to set up and offer charging services. I just spoke about uh, fast chargers. Uh, the trend is that we are seeing multiple CEOs, they're setting up fast chargers on highways. And because of that, electric car highway trips are possible now. Uh, this opportunity will increase for CPOs as number of EVs increases. The usage of these fast chargers will dramatically shoot up, especially with the launch of the Tiago EV. You'll start seeing more number of electric cars on the highways. One other inter interesting trend we're observing is that Small businesses are installing these inexpensive smart sockets. So if you look at certain uh, startups like Bolt, right, they're launching this simple inexpensive smart sockets uh, at like 2000 rupees or 4000 rupees. Uh, you can set up this in your business, it can be a garage, it can be a hotel, it can be a restaurant and you can offer EV charging to the community and you can make some money out of it. These startups who are uh, selling these smart sockets like Bolt or Kazam and few other players, uh, I think they'll be they'll play a very important role in opening EV charging to businesses and then you'll have a lot more options to plug in your EV. Next interesting trend is that we are seeing this mobile on-demand fast charging service. If you look at uh, Hop Charge is a startup we covered on, on our channel. Uh, they have this van. Uh, they with a battery pack. Uh, they drive their van to 
your location and then they do a DC, DC fast charge in 45 minutes or one hour. And, uh, so you don't have to visit a fast charging, you don't have to worry about charging, they'll come and do it for you. A pretty interesting service. I think this will pick up more as more and more EVs are on the road. Next interesting trend is that we're seeing new car segments are being created. We all know that you have uh, SUVs, hatchbacks, sedans in the car industry today. But uh, what we are seeing is now we have a new segment called personal mobility vehicle. These are small cars with uh, two doors or four doors that can see two or two people or four people, three people. And uh, it's meant for simple city runabouts, right? So I know at least four startups who are working on such cars, small cars that are in inexpensive and affordable and at the same time solve your purpose and they ensure that you don't have to worry about using petrol and oil. So uh, this is another interesting trend that we are observing. Let's move to the next slide, the way forward. And definitely the industry has to you know, participate a lot more compared to what we have right now. We need a lot more vehicle OEMs to get, get on board and launch multiple uh, variants of EVs and uh, start phasing out the ICE vehicles. Ultimately, with, if more big players launch EVs, there will be enhanced customer awareness. There is a lot of competition from Chinese OEMs, there is a lot of competition from EV startups and that will eat into their market share and they will not survive after 2030. So if the, if the industry is serious, they need to start launching EVs right now. We have multiple large uh, component suppliers that are diversifying and they are getting into EV component manufacturing. So we have multiple EVs in India that uh, that are totally made in India except for the lithium cells. This definitely needs to happen in, large, in a larger scale in the coming future. So there, is, there are certain high impact use cases for EVs like deliveries, uh, last mile transport. We feel that these segments will grow rapidly in the coming future. Uh, what can the government do? So the government has already done a fantastic job with the policies that we have, but they can do more. One is finance availability. Financing of EVs is a big issue right, right now. This definitely has to be re re looked at. Maybe we'll need a policy on this. If you look at the Delhi government, they're doing a great job with the Switch EV platform. Uh, they've created a website, they create videos, and they uh, they have a lot of articles on EV awareness. And uh, pretty, it's pretty interesting. I think Delhi government is very progressive that way. I think most states should follow them too. Incentivize more auto OEMs to get on board. As I spoke earlier, auto OEMs are not on board. They don't want to launch EVs. They hate EVs. They they are happy to you know keep the business going to sell pollution vehicles. If the government can incentivize them to launch EVs, it'll be a boon for the EV industry. Now let's come to the fun slides. So we have the top selling electric cars here, Nexon, Tata Nexon EV, uh, which, which is like starts at 15 lakhs. There are 40,000 Nexon EVs on the road. This is a huge hit for Tata Motors and this because of this success and because all the awesome Tata Nexon EV owners, uh, Tata is investing more in EVs and we're going to see more EVs like the Tata Tiago EV, which was, they launched two months back at uh, $10,000, which is like a, a fantastic cost, 9 lakhs and uh, 20,000 bookings in one month, it's fantastic, uh, very positive. And then you have uh, top selling EVs in India, the Ola S1 Pro and the Aether 450X. Two awesome EVs from uh, two awesome startups. They already have a pretty decent market share. And uh, we'll see more from these startups too. And these startups are encouraging more uh, big manufacturers to launch electric scooters. So uh, I wanted to highlight these two. I also wanted to focus on some stories. The EV community is, is a biggest uh, force for change. That's what we feel. And that's why we have a lot of these uh, real life EV stories on our, on our channel. So this Nexon EV owner, he has done more than a lakh kilometer right now. And he has already saved <laughs> more than 9 lakhs, uh, 10 lakhs, whatever. So the savings are huge. The more and more kilometers you drive in your electric car, the more savings you make. Essentially, this car prints money for you. That's what I say. Here we have another story where uh, we meet Ashish. Uh, he has done more than 40,000 kilometers right now. And he's a, he's a, he's a huge... Uh, He's a huge community leader for the Nexon EV community. Uh, any issue, the people reach out to him and he solves those issues compared before Tata Motors sub support does. Uh, so this is a pretty interesting story. And then we have these guys who, have, uh, who, who came on our channel and uh, did an awesome job talking about their Chetak and the Aether. Many people uh, wrote to us saying that after watching this video, they've purchased EVs. So thanks a lot for these guys. And, uh, the next story we have is the first owner of a BYD electric car in India. So we featured him in our story. It was pretty interesting, he did very well. Finally, the story I wanted to showcase was uh, Mr. Abhishek who purchased my electric car. This car you see is my electric car. I used it for eight years and I sold it for him and even he's still using it right now. He changed two cells uh, in the pack. He didn't change the entire pack, the pack is still old. In this video, he, t he talks about how to buy a, a used electric car. So these stories are very positive. 
and many people have wrote, wrote to us saying that you know i've watched your stories i've watched your videos and i've purchased an ev that, uh, that ultimately is very satisfying for us uh, many people have moved to evs by uh, watching our content or reading articles so that's a big win for us we for us success is not money is this this feeling right so yeah so uh, that's the end of the slide Finally guys, why are we even doing this? Why are we promoting electric vehicles? I just want to share this article which was published at The Guardian and here it says how the oil sector has a staggering $3 billion a day profits for the last 50 years. $3 billion per day guys. So if you look at this article here, uh, this is pure profit. If you look at this article here and should look at this graph, uh, they have been having more than a trillion dollars profit every year. The fact remains that in the last 50 years, these companies have made huge amount of money by producing fossil fuels. Why would you support ice bakers which consumes this oil from an industry that is clearly does not care about the world? If, if we stop giving our money to the dirty oil industry, that's a huge win. This is a big issue. This is why we have we at Plug India promote electric vehicles. Nobody in the auto industry, nobody in the auto vehicle magazines talks about this. Someone has to speak out about this, these atrocities by the oil industry. And I think it's time for all of us to get together and end this uh, monopoly by this ice industry. Ultimately, they're, they're, just, they're just the mafia of this world and it's time to end them. If you have been listening to me all this time, I thank you so much and appreciate it if you hit the like button. Thank you for supporting us and thank you for following Plug in India all, all these years. And uh, we really appreciate all your support.